At the age of 25, Kim Novak was immortalized, playing the twin roles of unassuming shop assistant Judy and the ice-cool femme fatale Madeline in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, considered by many to be the greatest film of all time. In the movie, Novak had to play a woman with a dual personality, and her performance undoubtedly drew from her own experiences, as she confronted the challenges of her own inner mind. Also, James Stewart's character, Scotty, falls obsessively in love with an illusion, shaping her and forming her into a dream, ultimately threatening her life. It was something that Novak would also have to contend with in reality, as the shocking, true menace of studio bosses was revealed to her in the most terrifying way. We're lucky to still have Kim Novak with us today, age 91, Perhaps her reclusive life and shunning of Hollywood has been the secret to her success, but there's far more to her incredible story than just that. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries. Marilyn Pauline Novak entered the world on February 13th, 1933, in Chicago, Illinois. Her mother, Blanche Novak, was a teacher who gave up her career for marriage and motherhood. Her father, Joseph, had also been in teaching before taking a job as a dispatcher with the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad. Growing up, Marilyn experienced what could be seen as a typical lower middle class upbringing. She was relatively shielded from the financial devastation of the Great Depression. However, beneath the surface of an apparently ideal childhood, she was harboring a dark secret. Many years later, she would reveal that she had been intimately assaulted during this period of her life. The details around this assault have remained largely undisclosed, but whatever they might be, they undoubtedly had a significant and lasting impact on her life, her career, and on her mental health. When Novak was just starting school, the Depression era was winding down, and America was on the brink of entering World War II. This period saw Novak getting involved in different wartime efforts, like collecting gum wrappers. But she was struggling at school, being something of a daydreamer. She was also painfully shy, and would hide behind the curtains at home when visitors arrived. Nonetheless, she was encouraged to perform in shows at school to promote the sale of war bonds. Overcoming her shyness this way was her first step to developing the confidence that allowed her to perform for the public. But it didn't make school any easier. She was a major target for bullies, and her inattentive approach to schoolwork meant that she drew little sympathy from her teachers. Not only that, she was relentlessly taunted for her surname, which is of Czech origin. This hardly abated when it was discovered that her grandfather's name was Adolf, a tough break for any kid in the early 1940s. Her classmates took to pelting her with rotten pies, and her parents seemed to despair of their daughter, who was unable to make friends or socialize, as they saw it, normally. This was especially tough as her older sister Arlene was outgoing and socially adept, and she was very much daddy's favorite. Kim would never manage to win her father's full approval. It seems that in Novak's family, her mother was the one who mostly set the rules, and she was quite strict about them, at least from what Novak remembers later on. Novak explained, Mother refused to let me leave the nest. An older boy with piercing eyes brought me a dozen roses and asked me for a date, but she wouldn't let me go. I pouted and watched the flowers wither and fall as I sat by the window feeling like a prisoner. I wanted to experience all of life that night and couldn't understand why not. In truth, her mother was terrified of the exploding crime rate in Chicago during that period. The family grew up surrounded by horrifying daily news stories of violence and murder, with an especially high prevalence of violent sexual crimes against women in the city. Novak's mother tried to disguise her daughter's age as she became a teenager, making her wear pigtails to look younger if she ever let her out of the house at all. So she spent time at the movies which became a form of escapism. She remembered, you know, my idol. I idolized Greta Garbo. I just loved her work so much. She was, again, so real. She was not 
to me, she wasn't stylized. You could see any of her work right now. She was just amazing. And what I loved about it also was there was an air of mystery about her work. There was always something more. She didn't give you everything. She held back, and I like that. Given that Novak would later play one of the most mysterious characters in cinema history, it's clear to see this influence from Garbo was significant, even at that young age. However, as she reached her early teens, she began to realize that life had cut her a very important break after all. She was incredibly beautiful. With this fact now recognized by anyone in the same room as her, her self-belief lifted. Despite her eventual fame in acting, Novak's first love was art. By the time she walked the halls of David Glasgow Farragut High School, she was determined to pursue a career as an artist. She devoted herself to every art class available. Her skills earned her a scholarship to the prestigious School of the Art Institute of Chicago upon graduation. Yet for reasons she kept to herself, she decided to enroll at Wright Junior College instead and took on modeling jobs now and then for extra cash. In the summer of 1953, in need of additional funds, Novak took part in a promotional tour for a major refrigerator brand, traveling with a group of young women to trade shows all over the country. This journey eventually brought her to Los Angeles. If there are a thousand stories of failed dreams, wasted lives, and endless rejection in Hollywood, Novak's story is the one which is the complete opposite. She more or less walked into Hollywood and was whisked to stardom right away. In LA, she learned about an opportunity at RKO Pictures, which was casting extras for the upcoming picture, The French Line, featuring Jane Russell. Novak later reflected, I never intended to be an actress. I never dreamed of it, never even thought about it. I became one because I was discovered. It literally just happened, as if by magic. I was still in junior college when I visited a movie studio in Hollywood with a friend. We'd both been in San Francisco on a summer modeling job, and I was asked to do a walk-on in the Jane Russell movie, The French Line. Soon after, I was placed under contract at Columbia and given starring roles. At the audition, she dressed up in a Rita Hayworth-style dress, draped her arm alluringly over a fireplace, and looked right into the eyes of the casting agents and said, All I want out of life is love. That killer line and her bombshell looks were all the studios needed to see of her. Columbia felt sure that in Marilyn Pauline Novak, they had found their answer to Fox's new superstar, another Marilyn. Marilyn Novak would, of course require a new name. In her early days in Hollywood, Novak's agent suggested she often dress in lavender, branding her as the Lavender Girl. The studio also embraced this marketing angle, and soon Novak's blonde hair was getting lavender highlights, thanks to hair and makeup teams. And it didn't end there. They went beyond calling it a fondness for the color, telling the press she had a full-on fetish for lavender. Her apartment was decked out in lavender, with pillow slips, lavender bath water, even a lavender telephone. The only problem was that Novak hated the color. This focus on her appearance was underscored by the studio's attitude toward her. As Novak remembered, the head of publicity of the Hollywood studio where I was first under contract told me, you're a piece of meat, that's all. It wasn't very nice, but I had to take it. When I made my first screen test, the director explained to everyone, don't listen to her, just look. Yet Novak remained determined to stay authentic to who she was, and she was influenced by her background in art. She was selective about her roles right from the start, leading to early disputes with studio head Harry Cohn over her name. He wanted a name that sounded more enigmatic and alluring, but Novak stood her ground. She said, he used everything he had, even the way his office was set up with this throne in it, and everyone else sat way lower than he did, so you had this man looking down at you. The first time I was in his office was when they called me in to tell me they had changed my name. I had a feeling that if I'd gone along with the name they'd chosen, I'd never be seen again. I'd be swallowed up by that name, because it was a false name, Kit Marlowe. I said I'm not going to change my family name. 
Harry Cohn said, Well, nobody's going to go see a girl with a Polak name. I said, Well, I'm Czech, but Polish. Czech no matter. It's my name. The compromise reached made her Kim Novak, and Cohn turned into one of her staunchest advocates. Novak later conceded, Harry Cohn did not make me, but I also feel that I probably didn't make me either. I think it was a combination. I think that's what made it work. Cohn and his team certainly put the hours into crafting Novak into the ideal vision of the big star they wanted her to be. The studio agreed unanimously that her face was the most beautiful they had ever seen, but they immediately sent her on a crash diet to lose 15 pounds. Then they made her dye her hair, three shades of blonde before they decided on the right one. Jean-Louis, the Columbia wardrobe maestro, was also tasked with fitting her out with a huge new range of clothes to complement her now tiny waist and blonde updo. After all this investment, Cohn was not the sort of man to risk any kind of damage coming to his newly formed star. He moved Novak into the studio club dormitory, where a strict curfew was in force. Anytime she left the studio club, Columbia's fleet of private detectives would swarm behind her, shadowing her every move. But ultimately, Novak's success would be measured by her ability, and as a complete amateur in the world of acting, she had a long way to go before she could be favorably compared to Rita Hayworth, or even Marilyn Monroe. Novak landed her first notable role alongside Fred McMurray in the film Pushover in 1954. This movie was shot in the deeply shadowed, mysterious style of film noir that was all the rage then. While the movie itself didn't make a big splash, Novak's acting and her so-called wide-eyed, undulating appearance didn't go unnoticed and received positive reviews. Following this, she was cast in the somewhat unpronounceable Fifth, with Jack Lemmon and made a brief appearance as a harem girl in Son of Sinbad, without credit. Her breakthrough came the following year with the lead part in Five Against the House, a crime drama that garnered her widespread praise. A reviewer commented, Kim Novak, as the blonde songstress who can't quite make up her mind about her man, is as tempting a dish as any to have been set before a viewer this season. Despite the initial hurdles common to industry newcomers, Novak found a genuine passion for acting. She shared, I loved it because I'm a very shy person, but when you put me into character, I've got that whole character. I mean, I became the character. Novak landed her breakthrough role alongside William Holden in Picnic. This part challenged her, especially in a scene demanding she cry. She sought help from director Joshua Logan, asking him to physically pinch her before filming because she confessed, I can only cry when I'm hurt. This method proved effective, contributing to a performance that not only catapulted her to stardom, but also earned her a Golden Globe Award for Most Promising Newcomer and a BAFTA Film Award nomination in the UK for Best Foreign Actress. The film was a commercial success, grossing over $5 million in the United States and Canada. Even as her star rose, Novak found herself back in a supporting role to Eleanor Parker in The Man with the Golden Arm. This project, however, became a valuable learning experience for her, particularly in working alongside Frank Sinatra. She observed the effects fame and other pressures can have on a person, as Sinatra seemed to flip from one personality to another, between two films they made together. She observed, in Man with the Golden Arm, he was so sensitive, God, and he sent me all of Thomas Wolfe's books, and he was just so caring, and you know, and then to work all of a sudden, and pal Joey, I just expected the same person, and yet I shouldn't have been surprised. I wasn't playing the same person either. Novak also shared her changing perceptions of Sinatra, stating, I loved him when we made Man with the Golden Arm, but when we made Pal Joey, he was another person by then. He was feeling he was the hot shot in everything, and I felt he was not very fair to Rita Hayworth particularly. He wouldn't show up for dance rehearsals and let her have to go through it all. Then he came in the last day and all our work had to be cut, because he didn't want to do this, or he didn't want to do that. 
that was so unfair and so unkind, so uncalled for. In contrast, she had high praise for Rita Hayworth. I knew Rita Hayworth only enough to know that she was just a tender, sensitive, beautiful human being, a lovely person, very gentle. Pal Joey turned out to be one of Kim Novak's most successful films, grossing nearly $4 million. Yet Novak wasn't fond of her character, feeling it didn't match her capabilities. During the period between her two films with Sinatra, Novak took on the role of Marjorie Ulrichs in the Eddie Duchin story, a character facing a fatal illness. This role proved to be emotionally taxing for her. Novak said, I remember feeling like I really was dying. It was sort of scary at the end because it felt like the blood was leaving my body and my face. I get into a role and I never was one who could leave it at five or eight. Her efforts to promote the film, including appearances and in ads for No Cal Soda, that also plugged the Eddie Duchin story, helped make the movie a hit. This promotional work contributed to her winning the title of Most Popular Female Star at the Photoplay Awards in 1956. Her next role in Jean Eagles was transformative for Novak. Despite her passion for the role, critics were not as impressed, with one commenting, Kim Novak is clearly out of her depth as legendary Broadway actress, Jean Eagles, but one can't fault her for trying very hard. However, the critiques didn't stop her from winning the 1957 Golden Globe Award for World Film Favorite in the female category, but her most iconic performances were still to come. Cohn, the public, and to some extent the critics, were all impressed with her continued rise. However, there was one man she could not, and never would be able to impress, her father. Joseph Novak was convinced his daughter must have slept her way to success, and was of the opinion that Hollywood was pure evil, and a place only evil could succeed. Nothing could have been further from the truth, and her father's attitude deeply affected Novak, and this was not lessened by the fact that Joseph suffered from periods of depression and bipolar disorder traits which Kim herself inherited. Sadly, they were unable to bond and come to understand one another. By 1957, Novak had already made a name for herself, but it was an unforeseen event that led her to the role that would define her career. Alfred Hitchcock had originally cast Vera Miles for the lead in Vertigo, but when Miles became pregnant and was unable to participate in the filming schedule, Hitchcock had to quickly find a replacement. He was familiar with Novak's performances and saw her as the perfect fit for the dual role of Judy Barton and Madeline Elster without even requiring a screen test from her. Despite Cohn's initial skepticism towards the script, he recognized the potential boost Hitchcock could give Novak's career and encouraged her to consider the role. Novak's response to the script was much more enthusiastic than Cohn's had been. Though she was hesitant about working with Hitchcock, known for his very demanding directorial style. She spoke about her relationship with Hitchcock, saying, I don't know if he ever liked me. I never sat down with him for dinner or tea or anything, except one cast dinner, and I was late to that. It wasn't my fault, but I think he thought I had delayed to make a star entrance, and he held that against me. During the filming process, Hitchcock didn't divulge much about his thought process to Novak, her connection with the script, however, was undeniable. From my point of view, when I first read those lines, where she says, I want you to love me for me, and all the talking in that scene, I just identified it with so much, because going to Hollywood as a young girl, and suddenly finding they want to make you over totally, it's such a total change, and it was like I was always fighting to show some of myself, feeling that I wanted to be there as well. It was like they do my hair and go and redo a bunch of things. So I really identified with the fact of someone that was being made over with resentment. I really identified with the movie because it was saying, please see who I am, fall in love with me. There were also issues over her compensation. Already a star, she was still on a beginner's paycheck. Columbia Pictures reluctance to adjust her salary led Novak to halt her involvement in Vertigo and seek representation from a new agent 
to negotiate better terms. This move prompted Cohn to suspend her contractually, but Novak didn't relent. Ultimately, the studio capitulated. To avoid disappointing Hitchcock and presented Novak with a revised contract that met her salary demands. Her experience on Vertigo eventually led Novak to hold the film and Hitchcock in high regard. Contrary to early apprehensions, she found Hitchcock supportive of her interpretive freedom, making Vertigo a memorable project for her. Vertigo is definitely among my favorite movies for lots and lots of reasons, as well as my feeling the most comfortable I've ever felt making a movie. Hitchcock, contrary to what I'd heard about him, allowed me very much to have my own interpretation and everything. Nowadays, Vertigo stands as perhaps the most celebrated of Alfred Hitchcock's works, with critic Robin Wood hailing it as Hitchcock's masterpiece, and one of the four or five most profound and beautiful films the cinema has yet given us. But at the time, the reaction was very different. Any recognition it received leaned more towards its stylistic and technical achievements, rather than the thematic depth it explored as evidenced by its Academy Award nominations for Best Art Direction and Best Sound. For the most part, it was criticized as being too long, too complicated, and too experimental. Over the years, however, the film has undergone a remarkable revaluation, cementing its status as a cornerstone of American film history. Delayed recognition didn't offer much solace to Hitchcock or Novak during their time, and opinions on Novak's performance were divided Bosley Crowther of the New York Times praised her, stating, Miss Novak is really quite amazing in dual roles, while another newspaper critic dismissed her acting as little more than competent. Novak shared her own critique, saying, I was really disappointed. They'll always remember me in Vertigo, and I'm not that good in it, but I don't blame me because there are a couple of scenes where I was wonderful. Jimmy Stewart, who played the haunted detective, has also seen a revaluation of his role over time. In the 50s, his portrayal of psychological turmoil led some viewers to criticize the film. Fans accustomed to Stewart's earlier roles struggled to reconcile with his character's vulnerability and vertigo. Modern audiences, however, are far more receptive to the complexities of Stewart's performance, recognizing the depth he brought to the character. But as the perceptions of Vertigo have evolved, so too have Novak's feelings towards her participation in it. The work I did in Vertigo meant nothing if no one cared about the movie. Luckily, Vertigo had a revival, and people had begun to recognize that there was something special, and it gained in reputation, but it just as well could have ended up rotting in film cans somewhere. When Vertigo surpassed Citizen Kane in the 2012 Sight and Sound poll as the greatest movie ever made, Deposing Kane after an astonishing 50 years at the top, Novak reflected, For all my misgivings about my life and choices in Hollywood, seeing Vertigo voted number one made me think that maybe my trip was really worth it. Maybe I did have a certain amount of value. During the production of Vertigo, Novak met a person who had changed her life in many ways. She met Sammy Davis Jr. in late 1956, and they quickly struck up a friendship. Davis had actually asked his friend Tony Curtis to make an introduction as there was something about Kim that made him feel he just had to get to know her. And it turned out that Novak was also an admirer of Davis. So at a party thrown by Curtis, they finally had their chance to talk and they talked all through the night. However, like any good Hollywood party, Curtis's bash was crawling with journalists and studio spies. It was only a matter of days before one of the many celebrity rags ran with the headline, which top female movie star, K.N., is seriously dating which big name entertainer, S.D. Panicked, Davis called Novak to discuss the brewing storm. Novak at first wanted to know if Sammy had been the source of the leak, but once he set the record straight, she was defiant. She invited him over for spaghetti and said she didn't care what the press or the studios thought about it. But Davis was, for obvious reasons, far more conscious of the dangers that face them due to the highly racist views of the powerful men in charge of the film and music industries. Novak was already tired with being used as a pawn by Harry Cohn. She did know that the rumor she was dating a black man would send him into a fury, 
but her connection with Davis was genuine and deep, and she was determined to keep seeing him in whatever way she wanted to, and she was equally determined to ensure that Cohn never found out about it. But it was a dangerous game. Novak and Davis were not only contravening the racist codes that existed among men like Cohn and his fellow studio bosses, they were also threatening something they valued even more, their finances. Segregation era audiences could well have turned their backs on both of them if news of the affair became widespread. Their careers would have been ruined and their respective bosses could have lost large amounts of money. Davis and Novak had to resort to covert operations to see each other without being spotted by studio spies. Davis even rode to Novak's apartment hidden beneath a rug in the back of his chauffeured car, only sneaking out when the coast was clear. Finally, Davis peeled off a chunk of his own sizable fortune and bought a discreet pad in Malibu, where he could meet Novak in peace. But all of this effort was, ultimately, to no avail. Harry Cohn was attending his brother's memorial dinner in New York when one of his gophers leaned in and whispered the news. Kim Novak and Sammy Davis Jr. have been dating, and there's even talk of marriage. The aide then dropped a copy of the Chicago Sun-Times in front of him, which was running the scandal story about the alleged wedding plans. Cohen flew into an almighty rage. He would stop at nothing to sabotage the relationship. As far as he was concerned, if the wedding went ahead, then Novak would have to face the prospect of becoming a widow before their honeymoon could even begin. He called up his old friend and associate, mobster Mickey Cohen. Mickey decided to get to Davis through his aging father, so Cohen and his mobsters cornered Davis Sr. at the Hollywood Park racetrack and delivered some shocking news. Cohen told Davis Sr., Listen, I got some terrible news for you. I just got a call from Chicago to hurt Sammy. The threat was that Sammy would have his legs broken and his remaining eye gouged out. He'd lost an eye in a car accident four years earlier. If he didn't comply with the conditions immediately and defiance of them would mean an even worse fate. Davis Sr. was well aware that the combined influence of vicious and dangerous criminals like Harry Cohn and Mickey Cohen was too much for his son to deal with. In spite of his own considerable fame, Davis Jr. was under the protection of Italian mobster Sam Giacana, who could guarantee his safety in Las Vegas and Chicago, but not in Hollywood. Cohen told Davis Sr. that Sammy Jr. had 24 hours to get married to a black woman. Harry Cohen wrote a huge check to the singer Lorraine White, and the beautiful 23-year-old married Davis Jr. in January 1958. But it was anything but a happy marriage. A deeply frustrated Davis Jr. drank the whole wedding day, and at one point attacked his new bride in a drunken rage, crying out, Why won't they just let me live my life? Later in his room, a friend burst in to find Davis Jr. holding a gun to his own head, distraught. The friend disarmed him and put Sammy to bed alone. The huge wedding cake downstairs with the word happiness iced on it could not have been further from the truth. For Davis, his subsequent relationships would lead to even more horrific treatment. As for Novak, she was deeply shocked by the whole situation and began to question her association with Hollywood altogether. She always maintained that the nature of her relationship with Sammy Davis Jr. was platonic, and furthermore, that it wasn't anyone's business either way. She said, It was a very dangerous relationship then. A white woman and a black man, no matter his status. It simply didn't mix publicly. I was suddenly in the eye of a hurricane. My agent told me my career would be over if I continued to see Sammy. Some of my friends wouldn't even return my telephone calls. Novak also shared her memories of their time together. The first time I met Sammy, he was there on the set taking pictures, photographing, and I liked him. He's such a delightful person. You know, he was fun and had a great sense of humor. When he came to Chicago, he came out to our place. We built snowman and we went ice skating at their place. And we had such a good time. He was like a friend. Irv Cups in Chicago was the first one who broke it in the news as if it was a love affair. And then the studio said, oh my God, you can't see him. But it wasn't seeing him on a love relationship. 
but it felt like, who's going to say because he's black that you shouldn't see each other? He was a great friend. We had so much fun together. We had good times. And they put guards in my house and all that. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I don't want to live like this. At least Novak and Davis could console themselves about the fate of the principal antagonist in this painful drama. One month after Davis's sham wedding, Harry Cohn died of heart failure after overstuffing himself during a dinner. His funeral was thought to have been one of the most expensive, extravagant, and highly attended of all time, at least for a private individual. The sheer number of guests was mind-blowing, and it led to a wry remark from the famous radio and TV host, Red Skelton, who said, It proves what Harry always said. Give the public what they want, and they'll come out for it. After completing Vertigo, Novak joined forces with director Richard Quine for the comedy Bell, Book, and Candle. Her enthusiasm for the project was twofold, beginning with Quine, who had previously directed her in Pushover. Novak later revealed, I was deeply in love with him. I loved working with him. The pair were engaged for a period, but ultimately did not wed. Additionally, the film provided her the opportunity to work once more with Jimmy Stewart, her co-star from Vertigo. Novak admired Stewart greatly, describing him as just the very best. He was so real, so honest. I never thought of him as an actor because he was just natural. He was real, and it was so wonderful to work with him because you could just bounce off each other. Because both of us, I think in a way, worked in the same. I wouldn't call it a technique, but just got into our characters so much and it was beautiful. Their on-screen chemistry contributed to the film's success, grossing over $2 million. Despite starring in several successful films in the preceding years, Novak's career trajectory shifted following the death of Harry Cohn, reflecting on Cohn's influence in the aftermath of his passing. Novak said, the problem was Harry Cohn was a dictator. He did everything at that studio. And when he died, it was like the head was cut off. The people who were left behind didn't know how to find a good script. I didn't want to go down the drain. So I ventured out on my own. And after a while, I had to physically remove myself from town. Nowadays, you can live out of town, anywhere in the world, really. And your team will keep you in the game and make sure you survive. That wasn't the case back then. Indeed, Novak's transition wasn't an immediate one and for a while, her routine at the studio remained unchanged. She took on the role of Betty Pricer in Middle of the Night, a film that did not sit well with critics. Despite the less than favorable critiques, Novak secured her second Laurel Award for Top Female Star in 1959. Personally, she regards this role as one of her finest works and lists the film among her favorites. Her performance in Strangers When We Met won her a third Laurel Award in 1960, and this was another project she holds dear. Novak's talent was undeniable, though, and she remained a celebrated figure in Hollywood. She continued to earn Laurel Awards annually, up until 1963, but a significant milestone came even earlier. On February 8, 1960, when Novak was honored with her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard, just six years after her debut as an extra in the French line, she was at the pinnacle of her fame. In The Notorious Landlady, she was excited to collaborate again with Quine and Jack Lemmon, but Novak found the project less fulfilling than anticipated and began exploring different avenues for her creativity. In 1962, she launched her own production company and entered into an agreement with Filmway Productions for Boys' Night Out. She was, this time, sharing the screen with James Garner and Tony Randall. Unfortunately, the film failed to impress critics or audiences, and it was the sole production of her company. After Boys' Night Out, Novak paused to reassess her career path, approaching her 30s, a time Hollywood often considered an actress to be entering middle age. She remained as beautiful as ever, Yet Novak was not interested in being pigeonholed by her physical appearance. She explained, If you're wanting glamorous or really beautiful, 
are really sexy. Well then, I wasn't really the one, but I could do all of that. You could just get really lost in that kind of image. Complicating her professional life was her mental health. It was during this time that Novak started to experience symptoms of bipolar disorder, a diagnosis she was unaware of then. If the specter of the abuse she suffered in childhood was beginning to weigh on her, the only means she knew of to deal with was to black it out of her memory. She described her struggles. I was very erratic. I did suffer from mental illness. I didn't know it at the time. At times I was focused. Other times the press would come on the set and I'd feel the energy of people laughing at me or not approving of my style of acting. You could pick up those feelings. I was distracted. I couldn't perform as well. I was erratic in my performances, I feel. This realization prompted Novak to shift her attention away from acting and towards something that had always been personal and important to her, painting. And once she made this decision, her Hollywood career was over. Like Garbo, her idol, she had had about enough of the oppressive, superficial, and bigoted atmosphere of Tinseltown. Novak would eventually share her perspective on leaving the film industry, saying, I think it's better to leave something before it leaves you. I felt that films were getting, they started to be repeated. It seemed to be. You got set into an image, and I didn't want to be locked into that. I wanted to keep growing, keep learning, keep expressing myself, and waiting around for a great role to happen just didn't seem right. I wanted to know more about me. Despite moving away from acting as her main focus, Novak remained open to roles that intrigued her. She was interested in portraying a waitress in Of Human Bondage in 1964, but the experience was soured by a difficult relationship with co-star Lawrence Harvey. Novak later expressed to journalists that she was miserable during the production. Harvey, on hearing her grievances, retorted with frustration. Why didn't she say how miserable she made everybody else? Following her challenging time on Of Human Bondage, Novak almost stepped away not only from Hollywood, but from acting for good. However, an opportunity to work under the direction of Billy Wilder and Kiss Me Stupid quickly reversed her decision. She had long admired Wilder and eagerly accepted the role without knowing the details, which she would later regret. Unfortunately, the film didn't meet expectations, and Novak later viewed her participation in it as a mistake, not just for the film's reception, but also for its repercussions. A few years on, the Novak family planned a trip to Rome, hoping to secure an audience with the Pope. They hoped Kim's celebrity status would leverage an opportunity to meet His Holiness. Their Catholic faith naturally made such a meeting deeply significant to the family. However, when they were denied this opportunity, Kim attributed the refusal to her involvement in Kiss Me Stupid, a fact that troubled her not for her own disappointment, but for the impact it had on her parents. My mom and dad, that bothered them a lot, that I kept them from meeting the Pope. It was one more thing to lay on me. If it hadn't been for you, we could have met the Pope and got his blessing. It's not known how devoted a moviegoer Pope Paul VI was, but it seems he wasn't too impressed by a film in which Dean Martin's main character has to have sex every night to avoid waking up with a headache. And so his buddy hires a woman named Polly the Pistol to satisfy the poor guy's libidinous needs. In 1964, Novak headed to England aiming to discover more fulfilling roles than she'd encountered in Hollywood. She starred in The Amorous Adventures of Moll Flanders, a film that, despite its success at the box office, left Novak feeling let down by its final heavily censored form. She commented, The censors tore it apart. It was intended to be a lusty, sensual treatment of a period in English history, but after they took the sexy part out, there wasn't much left. However, this venture abroad wasn't without its silver linings. During her stay in England, Novak found love with Richard Johnson, a British actor she met while filming. The couple married on March 15, 1965,
pleading Novak to step away from the film industry to focus on her passion for art and her life with Johnson. Returning to the U.S., however, her marriage with Johnson deteriorated rapidly, culminating in a divorce after just over a year, though they managed to maintain a friendship. Her hiatus from film eventually ended with her role in The Legend of Lila Clare in 1968. Director Robert Aldrich was thrilled to cast Novak in a dual role that required portraying both a murdered early film star and the contemporary actress reenacting the deceased star's life. Aldrich commented, What made Kim a star is the American male dream that there be innocence and beauty in the eyes and one millimeter below the surface, an extraordinary sensuality. She has that rare mixture, ice and fire. Despite this, Novak once again expressed deep regret over taking the part. She said, That was a weird movie. It didn't have to be that bad. I thought I'd die when I saw the movie. God, it was so humiliating. Aldrich made plenty of classics but this one was certainly in Turkey territory, unfortunately for Novak. In the interval following the 1969 comedy western, The Great Bank Robbery, Novak entered a relationship with actor Michael Brandon. The relationship lasted for a couple of years and was something of a distraction from the terrible film she was acting in by this time. In The Great Bank Robbery, she did little more than ride around in a pair of bikini bottoms. Novak then chose to participate in Tales That Witness Madness. She was brought on board as a last-minute replacement for an unwell Rita Hayworth, a gesture possibly made out of friendship, as the two were close. The film, which was promoted as an orgy of the damned, received mixed reviews, with Encyclopedia of Horror noting that while the cast was excellent, Novak once again seemed out of sync with the film's tone. By now, her career on the big screen seemed to be well and truly over. Novak's venture into television began with The Third Girl from the Left in 1973, which co-starred her partner Brandon. The TV movie was panned and did little to enhance her career. It wasn't until Satan's Triangle in 1975, set within the mysterious locale of the Bermuda Triangle, that Novak found a project that showcased her talents on television. The film is regarded as a supernatural genre staple, with reviews praising Novak's performance as both beautiful and compelling, particularly noting her ability to convey a mysterious, trance-like state effectively. This role demonstrated her skill in navigating complex characters, even as the storyline kept audiences guessing her character's true intentions. Novak's affinity for horses goes back a long way and she acquired one as soon as she managed to carve out enough time to dedicate to writing. She has spoken about the unique bond she shares with horses, stating, It's a very special connection. There's something. They make you a better person. Because they demand honesty. They're not going to respond to you, or understand you if you change. So they bring out the best in you. This passion led to a big change in her life in 1974, when she called out a veterinarian for her sick horse, which serendipitously introduced her to Dr. Robert Malloy. Their relationship blossomed from there, leading to their marriage in 1976. Novak has spoken on their partnership. My husband doesn't identify me as Kim Novak at all. I was out of Hollywood when we met. He was my equine veterinarian. He still is. He has no interest in Hollywood, and that is fine with me. Novak entertained the idea of having children, but in the end, she and Malloy didn't have any of their own. When queried about this by Larry King in a mid-2000 interview, Novak's outlook was positive. I'm very fatalistic, and I feel that if something is meant to be, it opens easily and is presented to you, and then you move with it. And that door was never open to me, and so here I am. But I have two children, my husband has two children that are like mine. After marrying, Novak and Malloy bought a ranch in Eagle Point, Oregon. Despite this move to a peaceful and remote setting, Novak didn't entirely sever her ties with the film industry, returning occasionally for roles in movies such as The White Buffalo 
a film set in the 1880s American West and shot in Colorado and New Mexico, and Just a Gigolo, where she played a less prominent part. In 1979, she was finally able to lay to rest at least one demon from the past. Her new husband was understanding when Kim told him she had another date in mind for that year's Academy Awards ceremony, Sammy Davis Jr. They hadn't seen one another since the whole affair more than 20 years previously. Novak showed up at Davis's house to pick him up in full view of anyone who wanted to see. They were relieved that no one paid any attention to them at all at this time. No spies, no press, just two people going out for an evening together. At the ceremony, they took another brave step. They danced together in full view of the public. Kim described the sensation as liberating, and also as a sign of how much times had changed in two decades. Not one picture. Nobody even took one picture, she said. And what turned out to be one of her most notable later roles, Novak played an aging actress striving for a career revival in The Mirror Cracked in 1980 adapted from an Agatha Christie novel. This film stood out in her later career, but it was her last cinema appearance for over a decade. Working alongside Elizabeth Taylor was a highlight for Novak. Following this film, Novak took part in Malibu, a TV movie where she portrayed a real estate agent in the titular California locale. She also participated in the 1985 reboot of the new Alfred Hitchcock Presents, in an effort to bring back the high-quality storytelling she admired from Hitchcock. However, her defining post-Hollywood role was as Kit Marlowe on the primetime soap opera Falcon Crest, a nod to the stage name once proposed for her by Harry Cohn. The character of Kit Marlowe, much like Novak's earlier role in Vertigo, was enigmatic and glamorous, living amidst the vineyards of California wine country before moving to a secluded island her involvement in Falcon Crest was a personal challenge. When discussing her decision to join the television series, Novak said, Everyone was saying, oh, television, it's so difficult. Of course, you wouldn't know. You were in movies. I'd like to see if this is really as tough as it is. So I did that, and I enjoyed it because I felt like it was a challenge. I like a challenge. Besides the occasional film or TV project in the U.S., Novak also ventured to Europe for roles, starring in the German film, I Have Been Very Pleased, and the British film, The Children, in 1990. However, Novak still yearned for a significant role in an American film and urged her agent to find one, and she would get one more shot at the kind of demanding role she craved. However, another important chapter in her life was about to close. She got a call from Los Angeles to tell her that Sammy Davis Jr. was facing his final moments on Earth, so she headed out to see him. Davis got dressed up to the nines for the arrival of the woman he openly admitted to falling in love with. They shared a last meeting and Davis died a short time later. In 1990, the talented director Mike Figgis offered Novak a role in Liebestrom, a film she found intriguing enough to consider returning to acting. She was cast as a terminally ill woman, reconciling with her grown son and confronting her past. However, her experience with the film was far from positive. Novak and Figgis clashed from the start, particularly over how her character would be portrayed in flashback scenes. Figgis opted to use a younger actress, Sarah Fearon, for these parts, disappointing Novak who had envisioned playing these scenes herself. Novak said, I know Mike Figgis thinks I'm a total bitch. That role was fabulous, full of depth. And when I interpreted it the way I thought was evident in the incredible script, he said, we're not making a Kim Novak movie. Just say the lines. Usually I would have just said the words, played it and moved on. But in this case, I felt so strongly about the script. I persisted and thought, how many more movies and opportunities will there be? He said, if you continue to play the role this way, I'm just going to cut you out of the movie. And he pretty much did. In this case, I take total responsibility for being unprofessional. He was not only the author, but the director. But he never listened to my point of view. It wiped me out. Despite the turmoil, 
Critics responded positively to Liebestraum and Novak's performance, praising her portrayal of the role of a dying woman. By the end of the film, her desire to act had waned. I got so burned out on that picture that I wanted to leave the business. But then if you wait long enough, you think, oh, I miss certain things. The making of a movie is wonderful. What's difficult is afterward when you have to go around and try to sell it. The actual filming when you have a good script, which isn't often, nothing beats it. Kim Novak's final exit from the entertainment world didn't come with public declarations or emotional interviews. She simply disappeared from it. Her decision to leave was personal and particularly influenced by her mental health, a topic that was much less openly discussed even in the early 90s. In her retirement, Novak hasn't exhibited any regret or sense of loss, a stark contrast to the industry norm, where some cling to their past glory for too long. She wanted a life that was authentic, avoiding the slippery pitfalls that have ensnared many stars, painting, caring for horses, and living out a happy marriage in a beautiful corner of the world was the reward that her hard work brought her, as is often the case with stars who step away from their careers. Recognition and accolades followed Novak after her departure from Hollywood became apparent. In 1995, she was celebrated by Empire Magazine as one of the 100 sexiest stars in film history. The Berlin International Film Festival honored her with an honorary Golden Bear Award in 1997. In July 2000, Novak faced a major challenge when a fire devastated her home in Eagle Point, Oregon. A tree falling on power lines initiated the blaze, destroying her residence within minutes. The fire consumed many valuable items, including scripts from her films, her artwork, and a computer containing a decade of memoirs. Novak took a philosophical view on the loss, particularly of her memoirs, suggesting, I take it personally as a sign that maybe I'm not supposed to write my biography. Maybe the past is supposed to stay buried. It made me realize then what was really valuable. That's the day I wrote a gratitude list. We're safe, and our animals are safe. And if she needed a reminder of the horrors she had left behind, she received one after a rare public appearance at the 2014 Oscars. Having been out of the limelight for decades, the press were keen to see how time had treated the great Hitchcock beauty. On exiting her limousine, people noticed that her face bore the signs of plastic surgery, which had possibly not been performed to the highest standards. The media smelt blood and went on the attack against the reclusive and now elderly star. Donald Trump even joined in on the assault on Novak, tweeting that she should sue her plastic surgeon, and other media outlets lined up to make increasingly charmless and even hateful remarks about her. Novak revealed that the comments were extremely tough on her. She said, It really did throw me into a tailspin, and it hit me hard. She acknowledged that she had made mistakes when asked about whether she had undergone surgery, but also questioned if there was anyone out there not guilty of making mistakes in life. This was more or less her final public appearance, and since then she has returned to the peace and quiet of Oregon, far from the spotlight and the toxic environments of Twitter and modern Hollywood gossip columnists. And she also describes herself as a huge fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm. When asked about her ideal day, Novak didn't hesitate to describe it as filled with creativity, nature, and the animals she loves. Sure, I have my regrets sometimes, but when I look at life and the river flowing, I feel nothing but joy in knowing that I've chosen the right path and I didn't need to cut down any trees to do it. Given the difficulties she faced at times in life, to reach 91 years and still be devoted to photography, music and painting, a love of animals, and of her family can only be considered a vast achievement, and that's before we take into account her brilliant career. No doubt her defining role was as Madeline in Vertigo, but there were many other enjoyable appearances, so it seems as good a time as any to go and watch a few of Kim Novak's movies right now, while she's still with us. That's all from this episode of Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.